is that? Oh, that music. Huh? <laughs> Jafar, you must come and see this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Iago the Pirate. Why didn't anyone ask me to speak? been planned. I'm just here because as I show up at every party, I usually just happen to have a portable microphone with me. Nice meeting Pleasure. you. This is really kind of a big shindig. I didn't know it was going to be such a big thing. Can someone please start talking about the parrot again? <laughs> I take it you've got a driver's license. No, <laughs> no, I, I walked here from New York. Please don't rush at me all at once, folks. I'm gonna go do some backstage stuff. Boy, I've heard some bull in my day. But yeah, I'm doing some backstage stuff. I'd love to talk to you, Gilbert, but uh, I've got some uh, stuff that I gotta do. Ladies and gentlemen, your host for the evening, film critic and historian, co-host of Hot Ticket, and the author of the book, The Disney Films, Leonard Malton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to welcome you on behalf of Walt Disney Studios and Buena Vista Home Entertainment to the beautiful Hyperion Theater here at Disney's California Adventure Theme Park. I want to especially welcome our audience tonight who are animation students from the California Institute of the Arts, otherwise known as CalArts. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> animation lovers are welcome here, that's for sure. And this is the home as you probably know, of the Aladdin Musical Spectacular Stage Show, a show that's been delighting audiences here at the park for quite some time now, but that wouldn't exist if the film hadn't come first. The film has actually spawned many different adventures on television, on home video, and now in live theater. And the film, like most animated films, didn't just happen, and it didn't happen easily. Every animated feature that the Disney Studio has done over the many years has had a circuitous path. It doesn't happen easily. It doesn't happen without a lot of hard work, second guessing, detours, and finally success. In the case of Aladdin, it started out, I think, fairly modestly, kind of like Aladdin himself, and wound up a big winner. We're going to meet some of the key people who brought this film to life tonight. I think you're going to enjoy spending time with them. So without any further ado, let's get rolling and let's meet some very talented people. First, the co-producers, co-directors of this film, who between them have an amazing 60 years of experience in animation. That's because they started when they were kids. They were animation fans. They've become master animation filmmakers. And with them is a woman who's their co-producer who never had any experience with animation until Aladdin. So a warm welcome, please, for John Musker, Ron Clements, and Amy Pell. Hi there, welcome. Welcome. Come. Welcome to you all. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, let's set the stage first for what happened. You had just done The Little Mermaid, which was an enormous success, but not just a success, it sort of gave people the signal that animation was back at Disney and in the world at large. So instead of resting on your laurels, <laughs> what <laughs> happens? Um, when we got done with Little Mermaid, actually, they at one point talked to us about doing this movie, <clears throat> Beauty and the Beast. They talked about us working on that, and we said, who'd want to see a movie with a big no, guy we... and a girl? And, and we we actually did one. turn down Beauty and the we Beast, turned that but, one but down. not for that reason. We were no. tired. We were, yeah, very tired. Um, but actually, Aladdin had been proposed by Howard Ashman and Alan Menken. And one day, Howard asked me um, what I thought of, of the property Aladdin. And I remember, I don't remember exactly what I said, except I thought that was, it was a fun story. Uh, then Howard went off and wrote an early version of Aladdin. So by the time we were done with Mermaid and trying to figure out what we were going to do next, that was one of the projects that they brought right, to I, I us. Remember. But we said we have our own 
kind of spin we want to put on it. What, what did the trick? What, what attracted them that, that you presented? We had a different take on the genie. Um, I think our original thing with the genie was just um, feeling like that Aladdin was the kind of movie that could be done in live action and sort of had been done in live action. And we wanted to find some kind of way of doing it that we felt you couldn't possibly do in live action. And if the genie were a shape changer, that was totally an animation hook, something that you just couldn't do in any other medium. And this was all new to you. What, what, what was the biggest part of your learning curve? I and mean, what, what did you experience that she you never had any clue? Was Ron and was just <laughs> it took at least a week, wasn't it? No. Really. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was like learning a new language. Mm -hmm. I had to learn all the different aspects of animation and um, how the whole production line worked. Uh, but my background was theater, so that I came to the, the storytelling and the musical aspect of it uh, with that knowledge. So mm -hmm. that, that at least helped me on the way. Now, in theater, you have out-of-town tryouts. Uh, uh, tell us about the equivalent in animation. You, you put together a, a kind of a story reel. How long does it take to do that? We, when, by the time we had the whole movie up, it was, uh, it was April of 91, actually. <laughs> uh, it was late, late March. And, uh, From beginning to end, yeah. the, the way this works, um, in animation, we actually sort of put the movie up on the screen before we actually make it, which mm -hmm. is very different than live action. You're uh, shooting the storyboard? Right. We, the whole movie is storyboarded. We've cast a lot of the voices. If voices aren't cast, we have people just doing the voices. Mm -hmm. okay. And then all the storyboards, and you could sit and watch the movie from beginning to end. You got the girl of your dreams. What more could anyone... Uh, uh, Jeannie. I'm gonna need a few more wishes. Oh. We showed it to our boss, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and uh, in a screening room. When we got done, he said, hey, that's a lot of movie. And he kind of <laughs> left it at that. And we went to lunch at uh, El Torito's and uh, we had a margarita. We each had a margarita. And uh, we, we said, felt what nervous. Did, yeah, we felt a little nervous. We were like, that seemed kind of cryptic, kind of a short comment for a long movie. <laughs> and uh, then we came back and saw our co-producer, uh, Don Ernst, sitting in his room and said, did you hear any more from Jeffrey? And he's like, sit down. He hated it. He hated it. We're like, he hated it. He said, start over. We're like, you're kidding. We had a margarita, but we had no idea. And so basically, Jeffrey, it turned out he had a lot of problems with it. So at that point, we, he, he was he really... He wanted us to start over, basically, from scratch. He said, even though the movie's coming out in a year and a half, start over. Everybody refers to Black Friday, but we showed it to him on, on Holy Thursday, I guess. <laughs> and and uh, Black Friday was the day after that. And just right. to put this in perspective, okay. what really made this scary is Beauty and the Beast was winding down. And in about two or three months, we were going to be getting the entire staff of Beauty and the Beast, the animators, the background painters, the layout artists, to come on to our movie. And we had no movie for them to come on to. So did you literally start from we scratch? Did, well, we or? sort of pretended to. Yeah. <laughs> um, we tried to be as convincing as possible mm -hmm. without really doing that. But mm -hmm. um, well, we, we did toy with that. But then as we came up with a new version, and, and two writers, Ted Elliott, Terry Rossio, um, they were good writers, whatever yeah, happened to yeah, them. They, I, uh, I, Pirates of the Caribbean, they just wrote. Uh, but this was one of the first things that they, they actually worked on. Um, and the biggest change is in the original version, Aladdin was younger. He had a mother. Ma, you've been up all night. Let me take it to Hassan. I can bargain with that old skin flint. I don't think so. His relationship with his mother was sort of key element in the movie. And in fact, there was a, a really nice song that he sang to his mother called Proud of Your Boy. I'll make you proud of your boy. Which uh, was a beautiful song that, that Howard Nallen wrote that sort of hated to lose. But I think we were in agreement that the film wasn't working. It needed, it needed to be changed. What was the biggest challenge in shaping the character of Aladdin? We know the genie's hilarious. We know that you have all these wonderful supporting characters, a great villain. What was the biggest challenge with Aladdin himself? There were several, but w uh, the one that comes to mind first was here you have a street urchin, a thief. And we wanted to be very careful that we weren't glamorizing that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, so we debated for many hours, days, weeks, and uh, there is a scene that really puts it all in perspective, which is he steals the loaf of bread and there are kids starving next to him and he gives up his bread to the kids. Here, go on, take it. 
so that he became a Robin Hood. And you could see that he was uh, a good soul, a diamond in the rough, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of the elements. I mean, one of the challenges was that in the earlier version of the script, he was called pure of heart, and that's how he got in the Cave of Wonders. And it's always hard to make someone who's pure of heart not be too goody two-shoes. And I mm -hmm. think that was some of the reaction to the early Aladdin, that maybe he was too soft that way. And I mean, also, when Aladdin was first designed, uh, Jasmine's design hadn't been... Uh, completed and so he was this young funny kid but once Jasmine beautiful woman was uh, designed wow. the feeling was she would never go for this little kid well so he we seemed almost to... too young that was almost yeah, I think yeah, they she, him she was older. overpowering him a little bit uh -huh. yeah. um, not that that ever happens in real life <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask all of you what were your expectations for the film what what did you hope it would be and what kind of response were you hoping for from an audience? When Beauty and the Beast came out and it was such a, a resounding success, uh, we were told don't worry, we don't expect Aladdin to be, you know, hit these kind of numbers. And so uh, we were just hoping to do the best movie we could do uh, that would be quite funny and, and different than the, the usual Disney fair. I've worked at Disney for 18 years and, and, and so we know the rules and, and you want these films to be timeless and you want them to last from generation to generation generation and yet with the type of comedy we were going for we, we we brought certainly a lot of contemporary references within the movie not and we, we went ahead and broke some of those rules after the movie was done everybody said oh yeah that was very cunning of you to have the kind of uh, Robin stuff for the adults and then you got the monkey for the kids or whatever but we didn't think that way at all when we were making the movie we were just trying to do things that we found amusing or entertaining or involving and we hoped other people would would follow and it really wasn't cynically put together it was I think that's a great answer because if you please yourself or try to please yourself you're bound to please others in the audience and Hopefully. thanks so much for giving us all these insights thank you, thank you. A thousand and one nights also known as the Arabian Nights it's a collection of oral stories that was collected around the year 1000. Hmm. Interesting. Now, what happened was that in 1704, Abbe Antoine Galant did a free translation of the Arabian Nights. That became the text that we know as 1001 Nights. The first time I saw Aladdin, um, I felt that it was very different from the original story. Yes, of course. How are you doing that? It's a magic carpet. The main differences are, first, there are no magic carpets in the original story. Wait a minute, Jafar, what if you were the chump husband? What? The Grand Vizier is not a villain, but a sort of self-interested person who wants the princess to marry his son, not to himself. In the original story, uh, Aladdin has parents. He loses his father, but his mother um, remains throughout the story. The mother acts as the mediator between Aladdin and the palace. You are a worthless street rat. You were born a street rat. You'll die a street rat. But in the Disney version, Aladdin does not have any parents. Aladdin is sort of a self-made man, and he makes something out of himself by, in fact, using this magic lamp to um, achieve his goal of marrying the princess. The other difference between the two stories is that in the original story, the genie gives Aladdin infinite number of wishes, as opposed to the three wishes that we get in the Disney version. Three wishes to be exact. An ixnay on the wishing for more wishes. And I think one of the interesting things about the genie that I very much like is that he's someone who wants to be free. You're a prisoner? It's all part and parcel, the whole genie gig. In the original version of the story, there is no desire on the part of the genie to become free. But in the Disney version, his fantasy is to be free. And I think that too is an American value that is projected onto this character. I think Aladdin is very well suited to be an animated film, precisely because it's a magical story. And cinema is about magic. Cinema is about fantasy. Cinema is about romance. And these are the elements of Aladdin. Romance, fantasy, magic.